All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and The Blackest Heart, both books published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today we're going to be reviewing, let's see here, God's Grave. This is book number two in J. Kristoff's Nevernight Trilogy. I reviewed book number one. You can see that on my channel. Just type in Durfee and Nevernight. The review will magically appear upon your computer screen. That's how the internet works. I've also reviewed Empire of the Vampire, which is a great review I left earlier this year of this book here. So now we're to book number two. We'll get to book number three eventually. If you followed my channel, you know that Jay Kristoff is one of my favorite new fantasy authors. I love his writing style and I love his stories. I love everything about these books, especially how they're put together. So let's talk about that first. The covers, the covers of these books, Every single one of them just has a fantastic cover. The cover, I mean, just look at how great book number one is, book number two. They look great on the shelf together, including book number three. The illustrator was an, a, a, an illustrator named Jason Chan. Did a great job. Also on the inside, we've got... Um, I've got all of my J. Kristoff books are signed. In fact, it says right on the cover, signed first edition. I bought all of mine at Barnes & Noble. Now, Barnes & Noble did a very special promotion with every J. Kristoff release where they give you, for a little extra money, you can get the signed first editions. I did that just because I like to treat myself to stuff because I got a big book collection here. I love to keep it nice. I mean, look at my... I mean, this is like... I got over 5,000 books, folks. And there's a lot of them that are signed. And I suggest you all get your books signed by your favorite authors when you can, if they're in town and you can meet them or whatever. Or if you never can meet them, like I said, sometimes the Barnes and Nobles just has signed copies you can buy. So there's maps. There's maps. I love maps. We're still talking about the aesthetic of the physical book. Now there's these great, great, wonderfully drawn maps and there's three or four of them in every book. And I absolutely adore these maps. Now, unfortunately, I cannot tell you who did the maps because I searched these books from cover to cover to find the name of the person that did the maps. And I just couldn't find it, which is a shame because they deserve the, uh, the accolades for doing such great maps. Now, if I accidentally, um, you know forgot to uh maybe i overlooked it i don't know maybe it's in there somewhere if you can find it drop a note please drop a note if you can find out who did the maps for these books because they're great um so anyway oh another thing about the aesthetic of the book we could go on and on there's this character list so they've got the j he provides us with a drama dramatic Dramatis Personae. What do they say? Characterless Dramatis Personae. Yeah. Where this is just a clever way, because he puts all the main characters in here with a little description of who they are. And it's actually a clever way of not only describing the characters, but letting you know it's sort of a secret synopsis for book number one. Because just look at this. Let's see. Mia Corvair, who is our main character. Under her character name, it says, Mia Corvair, an assassin, a thief, the heroine of our tale. If our tale can be said to have a heroine at all. Her father, Darius, was executed under order of the um, Senate. Vowing vengeance, Mia became a disciple of the Republic's most feared cult of assassins, the Red Church. So there you get an idea of who she is and who her father was, and we get a setup for the story. Now, the next character on the list is Mr. Kindly. He's a demon, a passenger, a familiar. Um, 
you know, he follows, he's a little, well, he's a cat that follows uh, Mia around. And then there's also Eclipse, who's the dog that follows her around. So she's got these familiars, this cat you can see on the back and a doggy, and they follow her around and they're sort of like little demons, kind of like if you remember that uh, magic compass, the golden compass. Yeah, the golden, the, the Philip Pullman books, the, uh, the, the, what was it called? The dark materials. All the characters have these little characters that would follow them around, little animals. And it's kind of the same setup. And Mia Corvair has a little cat, a little dog, and they're sort of like the, the good angel and the bad angel on her shoulder every step of the way. It's pretty cool, and they talk to her, and they're really funny. Their conversations are hilarious. Anyway, Mia is an assassin. In the beginning of this book, we won't do spoilers for this book, number one. We'll just talk about this book. In the beginning of this book, she is um, captured by some slavers. In fact... It's her plan to be captured by the slavers. She's got, she wants the slavers to capture her. Now, once she's put in the cage and she gets around all the other slaves, she sort of recounts her tale to some of the slaves that are in the cage with her. And this is where we find out why she wanted to be captured. So four months previous to her capture, she was involved in the assassination of a senator, along with the help of her demon dog eclipse and her demon cat mr kindly and um so she uh, was involved in assassination things are going weird things are going bad so she wants to get captured because the only way she can um uh get to the only way she can really reach the person that she wants to kill the most because she is an assassin and she's on a revenge quest from the beginning of this book all the way through, she's on a revenge quest to avenge the death of her father and family and brother, uh, which plays an important part in this, brother. The brother. Remember the brother. And um, so to kill the person, the closest she'll ever be able to get to them is is there's a, there's a, a, a gladiator match that's coming up soon, and he, she knows that that person will be attending the gladiator match. And the only way that she can get close to this person is if she becomes a gladiator herself. So the only way she can become a gladiator is if she's a slave, because only slaves are gladiators. The only way she can become a slave is if she gets captured. Thus, she sets up the capture. Then she finagles her way into the gladiator training pits and where she meets a ton of people. Um, so, uh, I mean, she, uh, here's the thing. Mia Corvair thought she had found her place among the Assassin's Guild. And they're called, the Assassin's Guild is called the Blades of Our Lady of Bl the Blessed. Um, and they are within the Red Church. And Mia thought that she had found her way into them. But even though in book one she had done that, she's still no closer to avenging the people that had killed her family. Now, when, um, but, but she's going to, she's going to, at the end of this book, she makes new allies in the gladiator arena uh there's a bunch of new characters and the thing is is they're all in the character list and so if you ever wonder who the characters are just look through the character list or the dramatis person i not only do it like i said we get the name of the character but a brief and very witty funny description of who that character is and um so spectacular ending doesn't even begin to describe how this book ends. I've pretty much set up the plot for you. Does she weather the storm of the gladiator arena like Russell Crowe? Does she succeed? Does she get to Rome? Does she get... And this is set in a very Romanesque setting. In fact, the reason I wanted to read this was because I was watching that show The Borges with... I can't remember the, even anybody that's in it. Uh, anyway... It's set in Italy, and in the Renaissance of Italy, and I was, like, bored as fuck with the show. And so I'm like, but I wanted to read something kind of set in that kind of flavor. And I was like, oh, I remember the Jay Kristoff books were. So I remember reading this about five years ago. I'm going to reread it for the channel and do a review. That's why I got reading this, because it's very Romanesque, and I was in the mood for some Romanesque storytelling. And um, the gladiator stuff. And, you know, does, does Russell Crowe make it through the gladiator training? Does he make it to Rome? Does he get to avenge the things that he needs to avenge? The very similar plot to this book. Does Mia Corvair get to the gladiator arena? Does she get to avenge 
the her, the death of her family and the uh, and her mother and her brother again. Don't forget the brother. Very important. One of the most spectacularly written endings to any fantasy book I've ever read, if not any book in general. Just absolutely delightful, bloody, exciting. Grim, gruesome, heart-pounding. Everything you want to have in a climax to a book. It's just in this book. I absolutely loved it. Jay Kristoff's writing is so crisp, so unique. I mean, you know that he is... There are books that you read and you don't notice the writer at all. There are books that you read and you notice the writer is trying to show off. This is one of those books where you notice the writer is trying to show off. And that is fine because I love the way the dude is showing off. He is, you know, it's not cocky if you can back it up. And this guy writes with some serious cockiness to his prose. And he backs it up word after word after word. And I love that about him. That's one of the reasons he's one of my favorite new novelists is because he aims for he wants to hit hit a grand slam home run with every sentence and he does and i can appreciate that he's just not lazily laying it down he is like really trying to make a point with his writing and he does it and it's a point and an angle and a level of prose that i love it might not be for everybody but i love it it's the thing that i like and i give god's grave another 10 out of 10. I think I've given every single Jay Kristoff book I've reviewed on this channel a 10 out of 10. I'm pretty sure they all got 10. Well, I've only reviewed these three. One, two, three. And we will review this one soon. Anyway, this is a badass motherfucker.